I don't know. I've got so much bourbon. I wouldn't have to buy another bottle for the next, I don't know, 10 years and still be okay. So (laughs) the hard thing is it's like, okay, (laughs) I could uh, just drink on what I have or try to chase these special releases. I don't know. It's, it's like a drug. It's like, well, I can just get one more. <laughs> I know. My wife seriously doesn't get it. I was going to say, my wife just <laughs> nodded her head in agreement. <laughs> like, yeah. Hey, everyone. This is the second Bourbon Community Roundtable with us and a few well known bloggers. This all takes place on YouTube Live, so you can actually ask questions and see it live as we record. I'm sure this is going to turn into a monthly podcast because it's so fun to get lots of people involved. The video is available on our YouTube page right now, so go there and watch the additional 45 minutes that didn't actually go into today's recording. This is the last podcast for October, so that means you've got just a few more days to get in your Patreon sponsorships for our October giveaway. It will mark our sixth month, and we're going to be drawing for a bottle of Willett Family Estate four-year bourbon, and there's also going to be some other giveaways, so if you want your chance, sponsor the show on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash bourbon pursuit. Also, for all of our people that are sponsoring us so far, t-shirts. I'm working right now with a talented graphic artist, and we're finalizing the design, and we'll be shopping around for printing companies very, very soon. If you got a hookup in the custom printed apparel industry, send me an email, the duo, T H E D U O, at bourbonpursuit.com. Happy Halloween, everyone, and we're going to see you all back here in November. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan here tonight for the second Bourbon Community Roundtable, where we have a good group of bloggers here. And Ryan wasn't able to make it last time, but he's with us tonight. So, uh, Ryan, welcome to uh, another great Google Hangout session. Cheers, guys. Appreciate y'all coming. Nice. Sorry it took me so long. It's actually not that nice. I'm kind of disappointed in this this really bottle. This the yeah. latest. Yeah, it is. Okay. And uh, well, let's yeah, tell everybody that's that's not on here what you're actually drinking first. It's a uh, William Heaven Hill, the 105 proof, 15 year. Uh, it's about 270 dollars, and I wish Ooh. I'd never bought it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, there you are. That's pretty blunt. So let's go ahead and introduce everybody. And I guess while you're doing this, also tell everybody what you're drinking on as well. So Blake, we'll start with you. Okay. I'm Blake from bourboner.com. Um, run the blog and website over there. You may be following the Pappy and Antique Collection release maps that everyone hates right now. Um, and I am drinking currently Rebel Yell 10 year. And then I was drinking uh, Abraham Bauman, uh, the Taruga, Tariga, and Merlot finished bourbon, um, which was a surprise find today. So, is that another one of those rare and limited releases that, that coming from Bowen? Yeah, yeah. We were talking about it earlier. I didn't, I had forgotten all about this one um, and saw it behind the shelf. And I'm like, hey, let me see that real quick. Um, and uh, yeah, I I had forgotten they did it, but it's eleven years, pretty good actually. Um, as far as wine finish goes, it's it's up there. I'm still a bigger fan of the Jefferson's Groth Cask, but pretty good for a wine finish bourbon. Awesome, cool, Brian, you're up. Yeah, this is Brian from Sipping Corn. Um, uh, more focused on Twitter than than Facebook or anything else, but uh, uh, I've got a bourbon tonight that a lot of people been dogging and I'm trying to work through my Elliott select. Um, I've got a Ooh, lower proof like that. bottle that I'm really enjoying and I see everybody saying they've had 10 different private selections that are better than the $120 Elliott select. And I'm not seeing it. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Um, but I'm a, uh, I, I am a fan of the OBSK and OESK. So that just might be the K coming through yeah. for me, but mm-hmm. cheers. Awesome. And then Jonathan, right? Jordan. Jordan. I was always going to mess with worries. <laughs> one of those guys from Breaking Bourbon, right? Yeah, one of real, those three. Real nice. So I'm, uh, <laughs> my name is Jordan. I'm with uh, the website BreakingBourbon.com. So we do reviews, news, uh, articles, and our big thing is our release calendar. So our up-to-date daily release calendar that we push out there all the time. And tonight I'm drinking Weller Special Reserve. So this has actually yeah. been my like house decanter bourbon for – I don't know, like 10 years. It's just cheap, delicious. And I don't feel bad about people coming over and drinking as much as they want without touching the good bottles. 
Well, good. We're going to touch on that one a little bit later because that that's one of sure, my sure. like grinds my gears sort of things. So, but we'll uh, we'll kind of start this off because I, I put a a um a kind of a, a agenda, if you will, today, and I put a few different questions out there, and, and I think it's some that are probably going to take up a good amount of time here. So the first one that I'm going to pose to you guys is. What is your biggest bourbon regret? Now, a lot of us, and also for anybody that's also uh, on the YouTube live watching this, uh, use the chat window and also type in what your biggest bourbon regret, regret was. Um, I'll start with me first to kind of just set the stage here. So I think it was in 2014, I was at a local liquor store here, and I was starting to you know, just really get into high-end bourbons. And oh, I've been around since 2013, but 2014, really starting to buy them. And I saw a bottle of Michter's 20 on the shelf and I said, oh yeah, I mean, I've, I've read people about this. I, I've got to have it. So I, I roll up to the counter. I got this bottle of Michter's 20 in my hand. She scans it and it's retail. It's retail cost, which was $550 back then. And I was just like, Ooh, like total like heartbreak. And I, I, I grudgingly handed her my credit card as I was shaking my hand and I purchased it. I walked out to the parking lot, sat there in my car with it, and I thought to myself, I said, there's no way. Like, my wife, she will absolutely <laughs> kill me. So I, I turned around and returned it in the store. So, I actually didn't know you can return liquor bottles. <laughs> exactly. So I returned it. And, and today it still haunts me because I would drop $500, like, no question at all right now in a Mentors 20 if I saw it on the shelf. Mm-hmm. So I'll pose it to one one. of you all. So kind of tell your biggest bourbon regret story. Yeah, sure. So I'll go ahead. It's kind of similar. So I had just, um, this was right around the time that Jefferson's uh, Voyage 1 had just come out. I was living in Chicago. I had just moved out of the city and I wasn't there that day and I was calling one of my friends. I got a phone call from him. He was in Benny's. He said, hey, I know you've been looking for a Jefferson's Voyage 1 and I have one in my hand. You know, Do you want to buy it? I, and it was about $100 more than what MSRP was, or maybe I thought MSRP was about $100 less. And I was like, ah, you know, that's okay. I don't really want it that bad. And looking back, like, I would kill for the opportunity to have a bottle just to try it and drink it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they did three barrels just to see how unique it was. Voyage 2 is one of our favorite. Voyage 1, just to see, like, that small boat, small batch. So, like, every year I think about that missed experience right around when it came out. And I was just like, oh, if I could only go back. Yeah. If only. Yeah, Brian, yeah, you're think- Yeah, so um, mine, I've got plenty of bottle regrets, both the ones I've purchased and ones I missed out on. So I thought I'd go different as I was thinking about this. And for me, it's it's not ever meeting Booker No. Hmm. And so he died early 2000s. So I think it's like 2004, sort of before we knew how important these guys are. And, and he's the one old school guy who I've, who I've never met. So my advice for anyone out there is if you haven't met Jimmy Russell, you got to meet him. If you haven't met Jim Rutledge, you got to meet him. Um, even go out and find the Ed Foots of, of the world, the Stitzel Weller, the last Stitzel Weller master distiller. Um, he's a real humble guy who's sort of shocked that he's turned into a rock star now. Um, and you, you hear book, you hear story. I hear stories now about Booker No, and I, I wished I would have met him and been able to hear some of the stories that that uh, he had that he had to tell. So that's that's my regret. Blake, your turn. Yeah, I was thinking about bottles, and there's definitely been plenty of bottles. I remember me and a friend were, you know, appalled that a store was marking up Eagle Rare 17 to 100 bucks. You know, we weren't going to break our moral compass and buy those. But then the the biggest thing that I probably regret is not doing the bourboner barrel purchases earlier. Uh, We got in a couple years ago and have been able to get some pretty good picks. But I feel like, you know, if we would have gotten in in like 2010, 2011, you really could have gotten some, some good and some more available bourbons then you know now it's like okay we'll give you these three brands or you know these few four roses recipes uh whereas a few years ago that wasn't the case it seems to just be getting tighter and tighter as we go on so if i could do it all over again i would definitely have started doing barrel purchases a lot earlier ryan what about you 
Uh, probably my biggest regret is bottles that I drank and I did not know what I had because <laughs> growing up around this stuff in Bardstown, it's like, I mean, my dad used to have Elijah Craig 18, 19, 20, you know, Noah Mills 15s and we would take them and just mix them with Coke at college parties. And like, like, <laughs> like we had no idea what we had. And it's, that's probably my biggest regret. Like what the hell was I thinking? But I wasn't so, but no, that's probably it. Yeah, I, I posed this question because it was actually asked on on one of the community forums, and it was it was amazing to read a lot of the people that most of them were bottle regrets. I think that was that was most of them, because a lot of them were people that said, "I I had Pappy twenty or Pappy decanters. I had three of them sitting in front of me for retail, and I didn't want to pay the what was it at the time like three hundred dollars or three hundred fifty dollars or whatever it was." And they said, I'm, there's no way, like never going to touch it. So a lot of people said about that. Um, there was one that's from another person that was pretty well known. And he said that he had access to pretty much every epic Willet that was ever released in Washington, yeah. D.C. And he, he had free access to it just whenever he wanted it. But, you know, nobody can, can, see, the, can see the future. So he only ordered those, those Willets when he was really low on stock and needed to just sell a few more. But it, the, it just kind of goes back and kind of just goes to show you how funny all this is. And I know that if we could have rewind the clock, you know, hell, even, even five years, mm-hmm. I think we'd be in a, a different spot than we are today. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. I passed up so many sitting on the sitting on the shelf back when it was there every day. Which uh, I think makes we you all did. think like today, are we gonna be saying this about, you know, Weller twelve in two or three years of like, oh geez, what were we doing? Passing on I guess nobody's really passing <laughs> nobody's on passing yeah, I didn't pass on that. <laughs> yeah, but still, you know, they're, they're, people are camping here in Florida. Yeah. Um but there was a time when you know, I could just go grab it off the shelf and now the label is going to change and people are going to be, you know, ISO, old label Weller, and uh, I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> the new old squat bottle, whatever it's called. Right? Yeah. 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 That reason. <laughs> the teardrop. So, so Whiskey Zealot posted and he said his biggest regret is a tie between pack, passing on the Booker's 25th at retail and also not stockpiling will it four year old single barrel rye when it was readily available at thirty five dollars. Yeah. And you know, this is actually kind of funny because it brings it up today that Will it actually had a release in their gift shop and it was a twenty five year old rye and it's a, a gold wax rye. And you kind of think to yourself, Well, they haven't been doing gold huh. wax in gosh, uh, since early 2014 that's when they stopped doing wax so yeah. the the msrp or the retail on this 25 year ride for the longest time in the gift shop was 300 dollars. i mean it sat there it sat there for two years nobody touched it and today they put it in the gift shop i am we're all pretty sure it's the same exact bottle just because it's a gold wax and they've just been sitting on it and after tax today out of the gift shop there was 800 dollars, and they sold it out <laughs> And they sold out in, I don't know, That's two hours. That's an expensive hours. piss. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So it, it kind of just goes to show you that it's, I think, I think Carrie might have, might have said it one time and calling it FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. And so everybody's <laughs> yeah. just buying yeah. up what they can get. Yeah. So, so p- somebody was mad about that. And I'm like, it sold out in two hours. If it was significantly overpriced, it would have, you know, it would have at least sat there for a week, but two hours you can't be angry at him for that uh oh um, no i mean i i think it, i mean come on let's let's take a take a step back and even think about what was named uh the whiskey of the year right mm-hmm. so whiskey of the year this year was booker's rye that's what was named and uh that kind of came out at what everybody thought was a, a good secondary price right uh mm-hmm. what was it three hundred dollars 250 yep. msrp right that's, yeah. that's pretty expensive and uh and so but it didn't really stop anybody from buying it. Everybody Hell, it bought it. Us, right. right? But I think it's yeah. at least, at least I think with it being chosen as whiskey of the year, it, it justifies the price tag. Um, now you all have probably tried it. So did you really think it would be considered whiskey of the year? Uh, I did actually, I, I thought it was really good. Um, you know, to say something's the very best whiskey released this year. I, I think that goes off personal, um, 
preference, but you know, it had a lot of things going for it. One, it was one of the last things Booker No laid down. Two, it's a once, it's a single mash bill of rye, so it's un, unlike anything else Beam has ever produced. It's Thirteen year barrel proof. You know, the list of catch words goes on and on for whiskey enthusiasts. Um, and it was really good. It, you know, the, the taste was really good. It, it, people say, Oh, it's bad. It's terrible. They're lying. Like you can't taste it blind and say it's bad. Like you can either say, eh, it's pretty good. Or yeah, this is really good. Um, so I didn't think it was a bad choice. Um, you know, but I'm also a big Booker's fan, Booker's Rye fan. So maybe I'm biased as well. You're the only person at this table has actually been invited to an official round table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's nothing to do with it. You know. <laughs> oh, cool. They, I don't know. We, we haven't. Have... Go ahead. I'll go ahead. I was going to say, we have, you know, each, the three of us at Breaking Bourbon each got a bottle, and we haven't cracked yet. We're looking forward to it. We're going to crack when we get together in two weeks. So um, if it's anything like, you know, I realize it's a ride, but if it's anything like their their last special release, the twenty fifth, mm -hmm. I think we're we're looking forward to some something magic coming out of that bottle. Cool. So the we'll the twenty fifth kills it. Um, yeah. yeah. Ab absolutely yeah. kills it. Um, but it was it's it's definitely in the top two I'd, at least, and I haven't and I say that because I haven't tried everything this year for, uh, for the special right. releases. But it's it's pretty damn good. Awesome. Well, all great. So the other person that said they, that they don't have any regrets, no regrets in buying bourbon, maybe they should have just bought more. So there's really no problem with doing that. I think. Yeah, that's probably should have, if knowing what we know now, maybe like mortgage the house and just gone out and bought a ton of bourbon. It's it's a better return than the stock market, right? Now. Yeah. Oh totally. yeah. You know, gee, that 2009 would have been the perfect year to just really double down on everything. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to the next next chapter here. And I, I pose this question, and I'll pose it to the the people that are on the chat first. Um, what are your thoughts on getting bottle signed? And I brought this question up because, at least here in Kentucky, we have opportunities all the time. You've got the Russells. You've got the Samuels. You've got uh, – no, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Of all these people who set up these private tastings and private signings of their bottles at – pretty much every liquor. I mean, you could probably go around like it, every week. There's at least one liquor store that's doing a signing with a master distiller somewhere. And so it's pretty easy to go and get these bottles signed. And I kind of look at it and I'm thinking like, okay, well, it's cool to get the bottle signed just because it's by the master distiller. But what after effect is that going to have on you actually cracking that bottle open? So I'll mm -hmm. pose it to you guys and, and what you think. I actually, I mean, personally, I, yeah. go ahead, Blake. I was going to say, I have a lot of thoughts on this um, <laughs> because I've had this same conversation with myself multiple times. I actually hate getting a bottle signed because it basically guarantees that I'm never going to open it or have a hard time opening it. Um, I should have grabbed it, but I have a Jim Beam single barrel that Fred No signed for me um, that I haven't opened. You know, it's not like it's, some great bottle, but it has a signature on it. So I'm like, I can't open it. Like I just have to let it sit there. So, um, I think the last real autograph I got was from Daryl strawberry at a Dodger spring training game. And after that, I was just kind of like, I don't know. It, it, it adds another level or another reason for me not to open a bottle which is what I don't need. Like I just need, I want to be able to open the bottle and not feel regret and not have that. Well, it is signed. You know, it's kind of one of a kind now. Um, so I'm not a big fan of it, but. I mean, I say it's one of those things to each their own. I have one bottle signed. It's, it's a trace bottle by Elmer and, and I probably won't open that just cause he's gone now and you know, it's cool to have around. But to me, I view it as one of those things like people who have vinyl or, or CDs that they get autographed. Like if that brings them more enjoyment as they listen to that, like, music and you know that album or that record and, and they're excited about it that's cool if they're just getting to sign to sit around like Blake just said then that's that, that's not cool like one or two sure but like when your whole collection like you got 10 20 <laughs> bottles signed like all right maybe that does it for you but maybe not like enjoy the bourbon that you're buying um but if you want to get it signed and crack and you know have a conversation with, with friends sure why not what I like about it is it means that that guy is probably not a 
flipper. He's a collector. And, and I prefer, I, I, my preferences are first a drinker, but then a collector and last a, a flipper. So at least the guy who's getting everything signed is, is not trying to, to flip them. And, and I agree with you, Jordan, if, if it's your thing, go ahead. I've got maybe two signed from uh, Jim Rutledge and one from Drew. And I don't think it's going to stop me from opening them when I get to it. Um, there you go. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it seems like a too much of a fanboy thing for me, but uh, to each his own. Now I want yeah. to say with Jordan. Jordan actually has you know the bottle of Elmer signed, right? So that's and that one. That's, that's different. Yeah, that's, that's like, so that's it's like actually, it's a baby it's not Elmer. It's actually a bottle of Buffalo Trace signed by Elmer that he actually picked out too. So <laughs> it's like a weird. I got this years ago. So, but that's like my like my one bottle that I'm like, all right, that's there off to the side. That's not going to touch. Yeah, keep that that's, one. Yeah, that's that's gonna be a tough one. I, I think that'd be a tough one to open just because I mean it'd be like yeah. having something that's signed by Babe Ruth, right? A baseball or whatever mm-hmm. it is. It's right. just not yeah. gonna happen. No, uh, Jim yeah. Rutledge, no, uh, um, Jim, a uh, few other people, right? We, all these people will be around to sign bottles for for a few more years, right? So, yeah. but then again, for me myself, I've got a few bottles of Pappy, and I know uh, Julian is is pretty good about signing some of that stuff. And he actually lives around here in this this neighborhood where I live. And I could always take it over there and get it signed. But I'm like, I, I don't want to do that because then I'm I'm guaranteed that I'm never gonna open. <laughs> yeah, so I, I sure pretty much. much I pretty much go against everything that's at a bottle signing and stuff like that. And Ryan, I interrupted you before you what you're gonna say. So so go ahead. Oh no, you're fine. Uh, I only have one bottle signed. It's a Parker's blend of mash bills by Parker. And uh, that's my favorite all-time bourbon. I have three of them. And probably when it gets to the point when I need to drink it, I'll probably open it. But for now, I'm going to cherish it. It's pretty mm-hmm. cool. I, I like Parker. He's a good guy. I've known him for for my whole life. So uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it when it comes time to drink it. Yeah, there's definitely a difference between having an Elmer bottle or the Parker bottle where you got a personal story with that. But you go to Kroger sometimes and you see the pre-signed Chris Morris <laughs> yeah, uh, Woodford <laughs> bottles, and you're like, why bother? You know, why bother? Yeah, that that one I wouldn't really care. I, I'd open it up if if it was already signed for me. That has that has nothing. I know I've seen <laughs> yeah. Trey Zoller's uh, Jeffersons mm-hmm. being pre-signed yeah. over at Liquor Barns as well. It's yeah. really just like the stock boy in the back of Kroger. Like, oh, people will never know the difference. <laughs> We're not gonna have an idea. There's yeah. there's no certificate of authenticity that's being <laughs> And then, so somebody else said that uh, Whiskey Zealot said, "Sign the standard bottlings, but never, always, never get a special one signed. Always, always drink the special ones." So that's a that's a pretty decent idea. So I guess get your bottles of Good Buffalo advice. Trace and Eagle Rare signed, and kind of save the uh, the big dogs for for something else. Um, he also said that I had a bottle of Booker signed by Fred No, and I've been upset with myself ever since because I can't bring myself to open it. Since then, it's just been only standard bottlings. And then Troy says, yeah. "Here's to the drinkers," which. Of course, we all we all love to see that. Cheers, cheers. All right, cheers. so this this next segment is something that was actually brought on by Blake because he posted it on his his forum uh, probably a few weeks ago, and I thought this would be a good question to kind of bring up and and even get out to some of our listeners. And it's what distillery or brand does the best job at marketing their products? And so make sure everybody that's listening in to type it in their chat as well. But uh, before we get to Blake, because you probably digested all the information from your whole entire thread, um, I'll push it over to the other guys that listening or that are on this panel. So go ahead and kind of tell us what you think, which distillery brand does the best job of marketing. Yeah, for for me, it's Maker's Mark, right? I think their advertising from the views is just spot on and coming up with like really innovative ads um, often too. And they're just really, just really characteristic of representing the brand and, and doing a really good job. And um you know, maybe Brian remembers this one, but this was way back. So I was living in Louisville. This was right after the TSA banned liquids going on to flights. And right after that band, it must have been within like two or three weeks driving into downtown Louisville. There was a big billboard and it was just a Ziploc bag and had three Maker's yeah. Mark, the little mini bottles. The on minis. It. And it said, right. yeah, the minis. And it said TSA compliant. And I saw that and I was like, that might've been like 2006. I was like, that is awesome marketing, like spot on, super quick. And ever since then, I've been like a really big fan of seeing all the innovative ads that have come out from that distiller and that ad agency that they use. And it's just in my book, it's like spot on. 
I, I agree completely. And I've, I was actually, I've never been sad to see a billboard go down or get changed, but that intersection where you're talking about um, is, has been bullet yes. and then other yes. things uh, since then. And I miss though, I miss yep. actually miss seeing a maker's billboard there because they always had, they were always so good. Yeah. Always had great ads. And, and so I, I agree with you. My, my pick is, is makers. Uh, the only thing maybe I can add to what you said is that their ambassador program is the standard bearer and that's part of their marketing. Um, I, I think the, uh, some other brands have tried to emulate that and haven't come anywhere close. Uh, from my legal standpoint, they've got the most iconic trade dress in the industry. That's part of their, their marketing. Kind of give everybody a little they, bit of a tidbit about the legal standpoint, because I know that's your, your bailiwick. Yeah. So I, I, <laughs> a lot of what I'm interested in are, are the trademark and trademark infringement cases among bourbon brands and Maker's Mark has been involved in their own fights and, and keeping uh, some of uh, Diageo's tequila from using dripping red wax and, and enforcing their, their trademarks and defending themselves pretty well on using handcrafted on their labels and, and those sorts of things but their their bottle design is unique it's got the broad shoulders and that's part of its protectable trade dress and then the, of course the dripping red wax and they incorporate that into everything and when you've got a brand that can be consistent from from the word go um, i think that's something the marketers can can work with and it shows that uh, that makers is 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 tops on marketing i think i don't think anyone even is a close second well, Ryan, what do you think before we get to Blake? Because I think Blake's gonna have a pretty good, uh, good, good in-depth or answer for a lot us. of pressure now. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, Makers is definitely the best. I mean, you just go anywhere in the country and you can find it anywhere, and the the billboards around town are just awesome. I mean, it's what's that one on the interstate says? low and slow like uh, traffic on the spaghetti junction you know like uh yeah that, that that always sticks in my mind but uh you know a close second i think that they're growing just so fast and spreading their brand really fast is heaven hill seems like evan williams elijah craig larson are just kind of exploding not only here but over overseas and i i, I think they're a brand that's just going to continue to grow and i, I think i don't know it just seems like they have just grown so much in the past 10 years that, that, that I've seen. Cool. And I'll, I'll give you mine before we reach to you, Blake, but you know, Brian, you mentioned earlier about Diageo and I think everybody kind of either, you either love them or you hate them. But I think what Diageo has done with orphan barrels is, is marketing and it's, is just genius, right? I, it's just, absolutely that is true. And what they've done with that, yep. um, by just saying that, out of nowhere, would it start two years ago? They've got these twenty-year-old bourbons that have been "quote unquote" lost, right? These orphans, <laughs> um, and and it's bullshit. We all know Book it's line like, Yeah, yep. there's there's no lost barrels that have been sitting around at some rick house that was never inventoried. We all we all know that it was somewhere, but you know they were able to buy these, source these, or you know, buy whoever actually owned the distillery or whatever it was from and, and be able to, to put a market on them. Not only that is they come up with some, some pretty catchy names for them, but I, the names are one thing. It's, it's the artwork I think that sells a lot of people as well as the bottle design. I mean, it's, it's just a very elegant piece uh, in regards to the bottle design as well as just the, the artwork that goes into it as well. So I think um, when you, when you have something that, you know, has, has such a, a prominent dress to it, right? You you kind of like, you're like, ooh. Like every single time there's a new Orphan Barrel release, I have to sit there and think to myself like, ooh, do I want to get this? Like, But I was like, I, just remember remember Forged Oak. Just remember Forged Oak before you buy this, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, I always have to sit there and try to catch myself if I am going to buy uh, another Orphan Barrel product or not. So Blake, I'll, I'll move it over to Hi, you. Uh, all right. Well, I wanted to have like a... Um, big dissenting opinion here, but uh, I, I think Makers is the obvious choice for who's doing it best just between their ambassador program. Um, you think about every one of us once we got started into bourbon, I get, or maybe before we really got started into bourbon, what was the number one brand? Oh, it's like, oh man, Makers Mark is like that pinnacle of what bourbon is. 
and you don't even realize there's this whole big world outside of that. So they've done a great job there. Um, Orphan Barrel, that's another great one because they took something, they took barrels that were probably going to be blended in some cheap whiskey and turned it into hundred to $150 bottles. I also think beam does a really good job. Um, you know, you look at bookers and how they've changed the bookers batches to have names and easily identifiable batch numbers. Now you have people say, Oh, did you get the bluegill batch? Did you get the, you know, whatever a big point. man or, um, yeah. Anis, Anis's yeah. answer, whatever the batch is. I think that was really smart. Um, a lot of the other popular answers, which I don't necessarily agree with are like Pappy. I think Pappy kind of was a monster of its own. I don't think that was, I mean, obviously they had a really good product. Um, I'm sure the Van Winkles pushed it, did a really good job, but that just kind of was one of those, you know, outliers that grew despite (laughs) what they were doing. You know, you can't, you can't buy that kind of attention basically. Um, but it's really seems to be the bigger guys who are doing kind of that more thoughtful, um, really purposeful marketing and, and that's being makers and Diageo seem to be the big ones. Um, heaven Hill. Uh, I, I, I think they've done a really good job. I know Ryan's going to hate me for this one. That's all right. Hey. I mean, obviously Evan Williams is a huge brand. Um, and I think they're starting to figure it out and that's been the big, you know, uh, how they've revisited the Elijah Craig with the H statement. Now the new barrel or the new bottles, new labels. Um, I think we'll start seeing a bigger push with that. Um, but it, it just is really the big guys who maybe it's cause they can hire really good PR firms. Um, because bourbon makers are good at making bourbon. They're not the best at PR marketing, everything else, um, that, you know, they have kind of that opportunity to build these cool programs, batch numbers, all that stuff. So, um, that's, those would be my pick makers and, uh, really bookers, but beam as a brand has done a good job as well. You know, you don't get to be world whiskey without having some good marketing behind your product as well. One thing I think, also too i forgot with buffalo trace it seems like they're using scarcity to their advantages or using that as a marketing tool they're kind of limiting or their allocations and making it seem like their products you know more limited or more sought after than maybe it really is i don't know it kind of yeah like- and, and i think they've kind of scared themselves away from that now is like oh geez that worked really good now we have people banging down our doors asking <laughs> why they can't get blantons or you know just regular <laughs> buffalo trace on their shelves and it's like oh shoot like what do we do (laughs) yeah they're like buffalo trade is limited one per person it's like yeah which you think is crazy and that's where you know they're aside from their other marketing is like posting a meme of john ham from um mad men and (laughs) that doesn't necessarily I mean, that doesn't hit me as the target market. I I guess I'm not speaking for the entire bourbon industry, but, um, you know, some of the stuff they do, I'm just like, I feel like they're just kind of maintaining at this point. Um, Whereas, you know, a makers who has people put their names on barrels and sends out Christmas gifts and all that kind of stuff, that builds a lot of brand loyalty. I mean, I talked to a lot of guys who have, been drinking makers for 30 years. Um, I mean, I'm only 31 years old, so there's nothing I have been doing consistently for 30 years. Um, to think that I would only drink one bourbon brand seems kind of crazy, but there's, there's guys out there who have been loyal to that brand for that long. So. Yeah. And to kind of just tack onto that, you know, when you Blake, when you were talking about the Van Winkles and, and what have they done in regards of marketing, uh, you know, Whiskey Zealot said that they've taken advantage of free marketing really well. 
you know, I, I kind of take your stance and, you know, they've, they've done a really good job of free marketing by not doing anything at all. Right. They, they, mm -hmm. their, their job, their marketing budget has got to be uh, close to maybe like 200 bucks a year. Like they, they don't have, to, they don't have to do anything. Like it's they buy like, someone a drink at the bar once. <laughs> yeah. Like they don't have to do anything. Right. So, so they've gotten pretty easy at this point. Uh, Travis Roberts says that four roses does the best job in social media. Um, every person on this call right now is on Twitter and has probably interacted with the, the Four Roses handle at some point. Uh, not only that is they are also really good. And, uh, and as you said, Blake, about the, the Buffalo Trace kind of like Facebook ads that they put out there, it's kind of almost like too cheesy, right? Mm -hmm. But I think what Four Roses does is a lot classier uh, in yeah. regards of what they're pushing out. Yeah. Yeah, Four Roses probably deserves a mention there because they're really good about – I mean, you think of – who's transparent and gives information that everyone on this call and most whiskey nerds want well, four roses. They're going to tell you exactly what's in the mash bill, how the different yeasts line up. You know, they always give years, that kind of stuff. Super transparent. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is, yeah, I mean, the best all around. It, it's important. You know, I, I reviewed the 1792 high rye and it's like, well, how high is high? Well, I don't know. It's <laughs> higher than the normal. Well, what's the normal? I don't know. We don't give that out either. <laughs> so, okay, so it's somewhere between uh, zero and fifty, <laughs> or forty-nine, I guess. So, um, whereas four roses, it's like no, we this is the thirty-five percent, or this is the twenty percent, and so I, I think that is good. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily throw that in marketing, but brand loyalty. I mean. I think everyone here has probably more than one Four Roses uh, private barrel sitting in their home bar right now and it's because it's a good product and like what they do. So, And I think we totally forgot to bring this part up about this whole thing. Travis Roberts even brought up the whole idea of celebrity spokespeople that are now starting to take over, right? You had Mila Kunis that's doing stuff for Beam. Um, and, and who is it that's doing it for Wild Turkey? McConaughey. Matthew right? McConaughey. McConaughey. Right. Don't forget Matthew. All right, Sorry. all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Got some regular IMDb zeal yeah. over here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what do you guys what do you guys think about the celebrity spokesperson uh, point of view that that's starting to come into all this now? Is it is it is it officially jumped the shark? Is, is that what we're going with? You know, it, it probably definitely jumped the shark when you have Matthew McConaughey doing Wild Turkey, right? But at the same time, you know, that's I've, I've talked to friends who aren't normally bourbon drinkers, right? They're like, oh, I saw, you know, Mila doing Jim Beam. So next time we're at the bar, like they get a Beam cocktail or, you know, probably not bourbon, works, but like a mean? cocktail or something like that. It, it works. And you know what? That's great. The more people drinking bourbon, the better in, in my book, right? Like, even though that means more people like fighting for bottles and stuff, if the more people drink it, that's just great because that just means it's going to keep growing and and we're just not going to get stuck with like a bourbon bust that leads us to like five or six selections of crap and a few special special releases. So it's good. If I can drink wild turkey and have a life like Matthew McConaughey, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm all for the celebrity endorsements and whatever. And hang out with me, Lacunas, all for that too. <laughs> I actually really liked what he has done so far. Um, because, you know, I was kind of expecting him to come in and it'd be like this, you know, he's going to be sitting there lifting a barrel up by himself and putting it in. <laughs> Do a push up off of it. So he can now lift a six hundred pound barrel and um, nobody realizes how heavy those things are, apparently. Um, but I think what he's, you know, at least in McConaughey, and, you know, I'm allowed to call him McConaughey, apparently. So, um, <laughs> you are boys. Yeah. <laughs> homeboys. Uh, no, I think what he's done so far with Wild Turkey has been really interesting. I think it's kind of brought in a broader audience, but it's still stuff that I watch as kind of a bourbon geek um, and don't think, wow, this is really cheesy. So, um, I don't know. that you, Wild Turkey probably deserves a little bit of recognition, but most of that I feel like is I'm just a big fan of jimmy and eddie russell so um i think bringing in as long as it's done in a you know where the person at least knows about whiskey and can relate there's actually some uh some substance there um i think it's a good thing now if tomorrow um i don't know like 
I'm trying to think you of see, those. See Rihanna or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah Rihanna or like Justin Bieber <laughs> shows up. Or I guess Drake has his own whiskey. Um, you know, Justin Bieber jumps on Buffalo Trace in uh, Lady Gaga. Gaga. <laughs> Never buy it again. I'm going to say, okay, maybe Up that's not the best market fit, but yeah. So uh, we were actually doing, talking about this. I, I brought it up before the recording starts. So that anybody that doesn't know is that Heaven Hill also is kind of in the, the celebrity game as well. And they actually sponsor an MMA fighter. And so they have, of course, everybody that doesn't Phil know. Phil Mr. Heaven, Wonderful Davis. Yes. That's so him. Phil Mr. Wonderful Davis is actually sponsored by Blackheart Spice Premium Rum, which is, of course, <laughs> within the Heaven Hill portfolio. So don't, don't automatically count them out. Just yet. I'm actually running in a 5K next week, so if Heaven Hill wants to sponsor me as a uh, <laughs> 30 to 35 year old age competitor, tell them to feel free to jump on board. <laughs> you know their email. Make it happen. <laughs> yeah, no. they don't <laughs> Just let Larry know; he'll sign you up. Yeah. <laughs> So we're uh, we're reaching towards the top, but I want to kind of bring up one more question here, and uh, and this is going to go back. Uh, to you all and it's one of the things that i kind of have a pet peeve about and and i'll kind of put this out there for the people that are in the chat as well and you know what are your thoughts on just the regular special weller reserve or regular weller special reserve and i'll kind of start off because it's one of my kind of like big staking points maybe not (laughs) just because it's it's decent like it's a bourbon it's decent it's okay bourbon but when i like i will that's like that's like the 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 bottom thing that I'll take after anybody's house, right? Like I'll drink regular four as a small batch over it. I'll drink pretty much a lot of. I'll just drink regular uh, Heaven Hill six year old over it. I'm not a big fan of it, and I think the one thing that makes me most like the most pissed off is that when I see people that are in the forums and they're like, "Oh, I scored this today," or <laughs> "Found at retail." <laughs> Or they're taking pictures at Kroger and it's like on sale for seventeen dollars when it's like only twenty three dollars and it's like who gives a shit? It's it's Weller Special Reserve, people. So I'll kind of, you know, <laughs> what do you guys think? Like, why do people go crazy over it? I mean, I'm drinking it right now, so this is. But I've loved it for you know I've I've loved it for 10, 12 years. It's cheap. If you like weeded bourbons, it's a great bourbon. And and for me, it's the one I always. I have a decanter. I don't mind leaving it out in the decanter. If people want to come over and mix drinks with it, that's cool. And um, I think it was probably one of the first like bourbons that I liked that was cheaper years back, so I stuck with it. You know, and not, it's still one of the bourbons that I recommend people are just getting in it. Like, oh, you try a wheat, like here, spend spend a low amount of money, see if you like it, first having to having to spend a few more bucks and get a different bottle. And uh, for those that do, then that's great. I'll just hook them into bourbon. But that's just my opinion. You know, a lot of people love it. A lot of people hate it. Um, I don't know. So it's better than Rebel Yell, and that's about all I can say for it. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> I, I haven't bought it since it was $16, probably whenever that was, two, three years ago. Never had a backup to it. It's it's fine. It's serviceable. But, uh, Kenny, I agree with you. You know, when you start seeing the crotch shot pictures in, in <laughs> someone's car because they just found it, you, you just got to shake your head and tell people there's better things out there. But but Jordan for an everyday drinker, uh, you know it's, hey, it's you know, just a nostalgic thing, right? It's it yeah, works. part part of its nostalgia, but you know it's it's totally serviceable. I mean it's it's fine, it's but cheap. and it's it's cheap. You know I'll get Four Roses Yellow Label every day before I get it before I get the Weller Special Reserve. Sure, um, but I I but to to the point of you know what's what, why do people hunt it or take pictures of it that part i don't get that i, I, I get that why you have it in a, in a decanter i get why you have it in your bar that's great but i'm i'm done with seeing pictures of it on twitter <laughs> honestly the bottle is just gonna make it worse too yeah and i think we yeah. can put a lot of this blame on blake because he's the one who made the, uh, the <laughs> yeah, well, happy poor famous, happy. Right? <sighs> so he kind of made that famous now I, we, he's, he's admitted that it wasn't his recipe he kind of took it from somebody else but he's made it famous and so now when everybody sees Weller 12, Weller 107, and they think, well, oh, Weller Special Reserve, that's it has got to be the next. must be the same thing. Something, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like the ultimate trickle-down effect of bourbon. It's like, well, you didn't get Pappy 15. Well, did you get the 10 or 12? No. Okay, did you get Weller 12? No. Didn't get Antique <laughs> either. Well, Weller Special Reserve is sitting there on the shelf. 
Um, it says Weller. Yeah, it says Weller on it. <laughs> it's like uh, the 10th step cousin of Pappy. I still have a half gallon of when it was the seven-year age statement that I'm holding on to just nice. because um, – I do like it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not like go. taking pictures of it uh, with uh, which I'm just going to fill everyone's Twitter feed tomorrow. Cause I know there's plenty of stores around town who have it sitting on the shelf. Like, look what I just scored. But no, I mean, I think it's, it's good for the price. It's not like some huge prize because uh, it is pretty abundant. Um, but you know, if, you're new into bourbon and you've heard so much about Weller and weeded bourbons and you may just confuse the two. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah. And and even here in Louisville, I think I agree with Blake that people just associate it with Pappy. So they see the Weller name and they freak out and they just get all excited, especially if you're new to it. And uh, I'd much rather have heaven Hill six year larceny, but uh, it's, it's still pretty good for a house bourbon. It's not bad. Yeah, and it, I think it, to kind of just add on to the things that, that piss you off even more is that it's actually, if you go to pretty much any liquor store here in Louisville, you'll see that Weller Special Reserve has a sign on it that says one bottle per person only. Yeah, and so, so that just gives you that gives you a tall tale sign that, you know, don't come here to Louisville thinking you're going to get good bourbon because it's it's gone. It's gone. Yes. Absolutely gone. It's all in Brian's basement. So <laughs> with that. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> no, it's in Kenny's. <laughs> I've been there. I trust me. It's there. <laughs> so with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up because we've, uh, we've, of course, as usual, we always go over our time limit here. But uh, again, gentlemen, I want to say thank you for joining us on. Uh, quickly go through and just give a quick closing of how they can find you on social media and your blogs and all that sort of stuff. Blake, you go first. Okay. Uh, Blake from Bourboner. You can find me at Twitter. It's Bourboner.com. And on Instagram, is it's just Bourboner. So B-O-U-R-B-O-N-R. We went over that last time of no E in Bourboner. Um, Bourboner. Or, <laughs> Bourboner. <laughs> <laughs> or at Bourboner.com, uh, sign up for the email list and you'll get a weekly to, you know, sometimes two times a week, just depending on how much I have to talk about that week. Uh, but it's down top of all things bourbon and whiskey related. Sure. So uh, this is Jordan yeah. from... Uh, breakingbourbon.com so you can go to our website www.breakingbourbon.com sign up for a newsletter we just shot our latest uh one out today and you can find us on instagram facebook and twitter at breaking bourbon and this is brian with sipping corn don't look for any newsletters uh don't look for any websites but just look for me on twitter it's at sipping corn s-i-p-p-n-c-o-r-n and there'll be a link there to my blog that's got uh uh, legal his, historical uh, articles and reviews and on Twitter you'll see random things like today I was out in, in Beatsville and, and posted a picture of the T.W. Samuels distillery and, and sent out a quiz to see who could identify it only had two people uh, get it correct and one of what them was the, was the Kentucky Distillers Association yeah I was just, what was the <laughs> final answer on that yeah T.W. Samuels Okay, um, it was. Yep, so it's right there. It's about four miles. I was in Cox's Creek earlier uh, this morning, and then it's it's literally like three, four miles away on Beatsville mm-hmm. Road. It's one of those great uh, abandoned distilleries. Now, there's still warehouses there. There's like 10 or 11 of them that uh, Heaven Hill uses and Maker's Mark uses two of them. But mm-hmm. the distillery itself is is in, in ruins, and it's just it still looks majestic. It's great. You can't find me anywhere, um, but <laughs> Kenny, especially not you can just follow live Kenny. podcast feeds. <laughs> That's right. Just, just, just follow Kenny and what he does at bourbonpursuit.com, <laughs> Instagram, and all that stuff. Cool. And so do, we'll, do your spiel, Kenny. Yeah. So we'll, we'll close it out. Um, just by uh, twenty-two catch twenty-two says uh, antique is readily available here in Austin. So if you're looking for Weller one hundred and seven, head to Austin. Uh, but with that. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Uh, Make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Bourbon Pursuit. Also, please, if you like what you hear, support the show, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And if you have any social suggestions, people we should interview, uh, get some other people on this, you know, 
roundtable because everybody's tired of hearing Blake. You know, you let me know, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We always, love, we always love having Blake. Uh, but uh, again, thank you all for joining in, and we'll see you all next week. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey. And for those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com. Thank you.